Okay, those of you just joined us, we're discussing the biomass is dead, or is biomass dead article. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, sit down there. Uh, dependence on subsidies, emissions problems, and other issues have put um, utility scale biomass on the decline. The viability of biomass as a fuel is dubious and it's not competing well with other fuel sources. For specific applications, however, biomass and other waste products, such as biomethane, may be useful. Okay, this brings up an interesting topic. So they mentioned subsidies. So how much should our federal government be involved in picking winners, losers, and energy sources? Is that? Okay, I mean, I'm not, I'm not coming down on either side. I mean, I, you know, and, and, and each particular case is maybe a little bit different. But you know, back during Obama, they dumped all this money into to propping up some of these uh, solar manufacturers in the states. What was the one? Was it Solyndra? Is that? Uh, I, can't, I can't remember the company name. They dumped like $500 million into this company to keep it, you know, going, competing against the Chinese. And so it operated another year, and then it went at bankrupt. Uh, Hemlock up in uh, Clarksville, Tennessee. Anybody familiar with a, it was like, I think it was Hemlock Semiconductor. You could Google that. They built a big plant up there, and uh, production, I think, has shut down. There may still be some aspects of that thing that's, that's in operation. But, you know, you can't, you can't fight the markets forever with government money. You know what, I, have I put our, our, our national debt calculator up in here yet? I will. Nah, I, I, I'll do it someday. I don't have much in the way of lecture. You know, I use that as a filler. But anyway, I mean, you, should, you can do that. Google national debt calculator and the first thing that comes up and look at how much money our country's in debt. I mean, that sucker's sitting there. It's $21, $22 trillion. And so, we're taking federal government taxpayer money or printing it or borrowing it from the Chinese or whoever and in supporting particular industries in favor of other industries. I don't know that that's appropriate. You know, now you can say if there's a, a new technology that's just coming up and you know, you have to, and, and you know, the Chinese government subsidizes their industry. So you say, okay, well, we're gonna support this for a number of years so these factories can get up to a scale that they can have a chance. Okay, you know, that may be appropriate with a, a brand new technology or something. So, I mean, it's, it's a tough call, you know? I mean, you don't wanna have all of our manufacturers left behind because of kind of unfair trade practices. And then you get into the local politics of the day where, what, this current president has gone out and renegotiated trade relationships relative to the way they had been for a long time. You know, this, what, this, this new trade deal between Canada, was it the MCA, they call it? Yeah, um, re, it completely replaced NAFTA, which was negotiated, I don't know who, I don't know if that was Clinton, I have, it may have been Clinton, was it Clinton? It was way back in the day. And that is one of the items that was credited with losing, what is it, 60,000 manufacturing plants closed in the US because of the unfair trade practices. And it became much more economical to manufacture in Mexico and China and other places. And so, you know, you may love, you may hate Trump, but he has taken some of these issues and he has, he's reshaped the landscape. He's brought China to the table with one agreement and that had never been done before. And he's redone NAFTA, which is, which is big. I mean, it's, you know, I find this stuff, and this, you know, this all relates to engineering because engineering jobs, plant manufacturing competitiveness is all tied into this, this international trade and, and other countries are wanting to pull production and all this and that production that's and development, that's engineering and engineering jobs. You know, manufacturing engineers, development engineers, R&D, uh, design engineers for new plants and facilities. You know, implementing the megatronics and the robotics. 
So if they ain't building the plant here, it's not going to do our guys and you much good. So you guys, you guys need to need to be aware of all this stuff and develop your own opinions because you guys are in a position to be educated and understand issues. Okay, by providing an alternative source of energy from a renewable domestic resource, existing biomass energy facilities, diversity of nation's economic portfolio, this is hard, uh, which can help our utilities weather unexpected changes in the price and availability of other resources or something like that, uh, Max said. Uh, an environmental attorney and partner with Troutman Sanders LLP in Atlanta, Georgia. Well, when you get the attorneys in there, you know you're in trouble when they show up. <clears throat> However, so long as natural gas remains at historically low levels, the demand for electricity remains flat, and the controversy regarding carbon neutral nature of biomass remains unresolved, the interest and investment in new biomass energy facilities uh, is likely to be low. Okay, so this is kind of interesting between you know, when you count emissions, okay, if I'm a company and I put in a biomass boiler, like a wood boiler, and I go get wood residue, you know, maybe I'm in the forest products industry and all that sort of thing, and I burn that in my boiler and that carbon that goes up, that's renewable because you can regrow a tree. If I dig a rock out of the ground in the form of coal and I burn that coal and that carbon goes up, that's not renewable. And so that is charged against me. Kind of interesting how they count. So, and apparently there's discrepancy or there's maybe not complete agreement between what carbon molecule, what CO2 molecule counts and what CO2 molecule doesn't count as far as counting your emissions. It's very interesting. And, you know, administrations change, philosophies change, and this, that, and the other. So there's some of that going on in here. So anyway, um, I don't think, I think I'll, I'll let you read this. Now, I will say this, articles like this that, that we don't, that, that I hand out in class that there's no assignment on, the assignment is to read this because on the big test, you know, we might have a 50 or 60 question test, I'll put five or 10 off of these. So you need to keep these and read them. I don't think I had said that yet, but that's my, I gotta have a hook or you won't read them. I know Spencer too well. Spencer, he's a great kid, a great young man, great future, but if I don't put a little hook in there, Spencer's gonna go, eh, you know, whatever. So I got you, Spencer. You gotta read it. All right, see, I'll read this stuff. Cause I keep them all on my computer, see. Uh, and then when I make up tests, I go, well, okay. That's enough on the real stuff. Now let me pull up the articles and I'll go and I go through here and I go, okay, what can I, if you read this, what would you know? And I try to pick something easy, but something you're not gonna know if you didn't read it. So that's my, that's my philosophy on that. So just thought I'd let you know that. Okay, um, also on Tuesday, you will get uh, your thermo homework assignment, which is, Rankin cycle problems. And, you know, when you took thermo one and two, you got kind of the small and the medium sized problems. But you're big people now. You get, the, you, you get real problems now. So there's only three or four of them, but they're slightly different. You know, they're the ones at the very end of the thermo book or ones that I've made up. So just kind of, when you think ahead for your time, it will take some time to work these problems. Okay. But you will get those on uh, Tuesday. Okay? Uh, let's see. We probably should set lights, right? This is a little hard to see the board. It is right after lunch. So put you on your best behavior. Oh, don't do this silly thing.
Okay, we did that. Uh, okay, so we're still doing fundamentals. Hopefully we can get through mo most of this today. But okay, so for the ideal Rankine cycle, we can use the area under the TS diagram to represent heat transfers. If it's non-ideal, then that doesn't work exactly. It's still qua uh, qualitatively close, but it is quantitatively accurate for the ideal Rankine cycle. And so, these, so uh, this area represents the boiler heat input. So it is from, we're showing four coming out of the pump. And of course the, the, the shading's not perfect, but anyway, it's the area from four up to A over to one, down to the bottom axis B over to A and back up to four. It's that entire area enclosed by the uh, boiler heat addition from uh, four to one, okay? All right, and so then uh, the following area is the uh, heat rejection from the condenser. So it just goes, it's this nice little rectangle down here from two to three to C to B to two, whichever one you wanna go around. But that area represents the heat rejected by the condenser to the environment. Okay, and then of course, the net enclosed by the cycle is the net work or net heat for a cycle. Okay, so that's the area representation. Questions? Pretty straightforward. Okay, now we're gonna look at uh, effects of efficiency on the Rankine cycle based on making uh, changes. And the first thing we'll look at is if we could lower the condenser pressure, okay? And so you see on the diagram, uh, we've got our basic little cycle here. So from one would be out of the boiler, two's the turbine, three's the condenser, four's, uh, three to four is the pump, and four to one is the uh, steam addition. So, and he's saying, okay, well, let's just, let's suppose that condenser pressure is atmospheric. So it's uh, what one atmosphere or 14.7 PSIA or you know whichever system of units you like. So that's what that isobar is across there. Okay, and then where the 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 second cycle, the modification would be to drop condenser pressure less than P atmosphere. This could be maybe one or two PSIA and far less than one atmosphere. And so we get the we get the nifty little moving lines. So what the, the blue right there is atmospheric pressure. And then down below is less than atmosphere. Ah! <laughs> I just love that. I don't know why. That's pretty cool. So anyway, that's, that's what it would look like on the cycle. Now, what's, what's happening also, look what happens to temperature. Yeah. He's working degrees C, and so at atmospheric pressure, water boilers boils at 100 degrees C. So, you know, this is condensing. So you need something here, you need your condenser water, what? You know, colder than 100 degrees C because you gotta transfer that heat out at 100 degrees C. So maybe it's 80. Here, it doesn't put a number, but that's way cooler. So you gotta have colder condenser water to be able to transfer the heat to it. So that's really what the limit is, is how cold can we find something in the environment that we can use to dump this heat to. Okay, so that's what he's showing here, that down here at the bottom, it's whatever that temperature is, it's less than 100, and it's determined by what, how low the pressure is. So, so now our general guidelines in thinking about improving efficiency is if we can increase the average temperature during the heat addition, efficiency goes up, keeping 
the heat rejection temperature constant. Or if we can keep the average temperature during the heat addition constant we, and lower the condensing temperature or the average temperature during the heat rejection will increase cycle efficiency. Well, we are obviously decreasing the average temperature during the heat rejection because it's rejected at constant temperature and it's whatever uh, temperature goes along, whatever the saturation temperature is for this pressure is the temperature along there. And then of course the ambient has to be colder than that. So he shows ambient down here to be able to get the heat to flow in that direction. Okay, so there's no doubt that going from the initial cycle to the prime cycle is going to reduce the average temperature during the heat rejection. That's clear. Now, what he doesn't go into here is, doesn't mention, what happens to the average temperature during the heat addition for this change? Initially, what? We're going from, we start at four, because that's out of our pump, and we wind up at one. So whatever that average temperature is for that process, someplace up in here, that's the initial. The final, I'm starting down here at four double prime, which is less. And so I'm winding the rest. Once I get to here, it's the same. So the average temperature during the heat addition is declining here a little bit. Well, he doesn't talk about that in the thermal book, but it's true. But if you work problems with this, you will quickly learn that this lowering condenser pressure does result in this effect is more pronounced than this effect is the way it works out. But that's not discussed here, but I think it should be. So anyway. Questions on that? Okay, move right along. Um, so he's just talking about this environmental for uh, heat rejection to the surroundings, the lowest feasible condenser pressure. And this is not even really feasible. The, the lowest theoretical condenser pressure is the saturation pressure according to ambient temperature. Well, you, you, you know, you can't at ambient temperature, if your condenser temperature is the same as the ambient, how big does your heat exchanger have to be? Infinite. You can't afford an infinite heat exchanger, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, even these billionaires running for office can't afford that, you know. So it has to be uh, somewhat above the, the ambient temperature. Um, and then this is, he's justifying the use of condensers here. We've talked about this. Um, you know, there's, um, you just can't afford to throw the working fluid away. So I'll, I'll let you read that. There's, okay. Um, let's see, steam condenser, then discharge, heat transfer, well, cooling water. Oh, yeah, he's talking about all the heat that, uh, is transferred to the cooling water. And the issue here is that um, it's just so, the temperature is so low, it doesn't have any, uh, there, there, there's no possibility of using it. We talked about that. Okay, so let's move on to, on the other side of things, let's increase boiler pressure. And this is probably more of interest because we don't really have a way to uh, make the ambient colder, but we do have a way to increase boiler pressure. So again, we have the first uh, cycle, the one, two, three, four, back to one. Um, and that's at this initial pressure. And then we're going to look at if we increase boiler pressure, then we'll go up. And so then at the higher pressure, our cycle is what? One prime, two prime, three, four prime, one prime. And so that's what it looks like. Now, okay, so do you have any observations? There is one for sure big negative that shows up from the diagram. This is one we mentioned last time in another regard. But if, huh? 
Go, go. The place where the, is it where it falls down in the coastal or in the major yeah. region? Yeah, absolutely. It's that this two prime is so far is moving towards wetter and wetter steam. And so the turbine doesn't like this, okay? And of course, you know, now the temperature at the top of the cycle is definitely higher. And so the, temp the average temperature during the heat addition is going up. There ain't any doubt about that because we're starting at four prime, we're ending at one prime. We're comparing that to starting at one and ending at four. The whole cycle is above it. And so the average temperature has to go up. The heat rejection temperature in this case stays exactly the same because we haven't monkeyed with the condenser pressure. So that's all the same. So there's no doubt this is gonna help us. Now, the other downside is do we have materials? You know, how high are we going? How high is that temperature going up here where we come across the dome? And if we even superheat after that, do we have materials that can withstand that for you know, 20 plus years, which we would like to see in a power plant component? Okay, so he's just showing the average temperature there and the average temperature there. Um, so, you know, so the, the, uh, the declaration is that increasing boiler pressure tends to increase thermal efficiency, which is a good thing. However, uh, he, now he's gonna talk about the quality and we're gonna have the little X is gonna slide here for us. Here, there we go, slipped over there. Let me do that again just for fun. And turned into an X2 prime from an X2. So that's going to hurt the uh, quality of the steam and hurts the, the turbine. So that's what that one's about. Okay. So, well, what are some things we could do in the cycle that could maybe, you know, maybe we could add components or maybe we could get crafty here and uh, be able to operate at higher pressures and still not destroy our turbines. So we're gonna look at, um, uh, let's see, what, what can we, uh, yeah, okay. So we'll look at superheat and reheat here. Okay, so first thing we could do is we could not just do saturated vapor, we could do reheat. And so now um, we're gonna go, instead of stopping at one, we're gonna go out to one prime and that obviously is jacking up the temperature out here. So that's gonna help the average temperature during the heat addition. And it's also gonna move the point coming out of the turbine much further uh, to the right, which decreases the moisture content. And so superheat is a good thing all around. Okay, average temperature, higher, so we get higher thermal efficiency and we help the turbine. So that's all, it's all good. Oh, and we're going to slide the, X, the quality again. Slipping right over there. Oh, that's so much fun. We'll do it again. There we go. So that's good. That's a good thing. Um, and his terminology, I, this may be official, but I mean, when you go in the, you go in the utility industry, a boiler is a boiler. You can call a steam generator if you want to. That's fine. You can call a boiler if you want to. Nobody's going to look down the end of the nose. You may have the biggest boiler in the world out there with all this different stuff on there, and you don't have to call it a steam generator. It's okay to call it a boiler. Okay, reheat is uh, another uh, modification that's used with superheat. Um, and it helps to increase the thermal efficiency and it also helps the turbine. So, you know, what are we doing now? This is, this is pretty, this is kind of costly, right? Because now we've got our turbine is in two sections or we have two different turbines as the case usually is. And so we come out of our boiler down here, main steam at one, we go, we expand through the high pressure turbine and now, right now, this, this cycle doesn't have any regeneration. We're not extracting anything. When we get to the real deal, we'll do this and we'll do extractions. But, and that's what you get to do homework on. But so on uh, just the reheat, so we come out of this term and we go back to the boiler and we pick up temperature again, and then we come back to the low pressure term. 
expand through that and go down to the condenser. And you can look on the TS diagram what it looks like. Now we've got, um, well, we've got three pressures involved. We've got the main steam pressure coming out of the boiler. We've got the reheat pressure and we've got the condenser pressure down here. So we got three ISO bars that we're working with, okay? So we come out of the boiler up here at T1 and superheated now. And so we're coming straight down. So this is still an ideal turbine. All of these little straight down lines are gonna bend off, right? When we do it for a real turbine. So we're also not including that yet. But so we're isentropic on the first turbine. We drop straight down till we hit the, the, uh, the, the reheat pressure and we go back to the boiler and we reheat to some temperature. Often it's the same as T1, but it doesn't have to be. Different cycles are designed with different temperatures. So we're going back to the boiler, we're picking up temperature. In here, we're staying at the same pressure. In a real cycle, what that one at Kingston, we lost what, 40, 45 pounds of pressure from where we, from here over to here by going back through that heat exchanger. So there is, in reality, there is a pressure loss. But anyway, so we get to three and then we expand through the second turbine and we come down to the condenser pressure and then we're going condense, pump, and then back in the boiler, okay? So that's the cycle. And I mean, that, that helps us all over the place, right? So now, instead of coming into the dome at four prime, at the low pressure, we're at four, so we have uh, less moisture, and our average temperature during the heat additions is 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 in, increased because we spend more time at the higher end of it. Okay, so with reheat steam quality uh, four, so we talked about that. Okay, uh, we're going to slide the X again. Mm right on over there. Okay. Uh, departures of the reheat cycle, uh, some are consider this for root. What is this? Oh, he's just showing the picture, I guess. Process one to two, well, process three to four. I'm sorry, that's just, so, you know, we, to calculate turbine work now, you, you have to, you have to uh, consider both sections of the turbine for sure. Um, Steamers ran through. I think that's all agreed to. Uh, if necessary, you got to do both sections of the turbine. Oh yeah, and when you do the boiler calculation, don't forget. I mean, this is not this is not free energy. You you know, we have to we have to spend money to burn more fuel. So we've got our heat transfer going on here, but we've also got heat transfer going on here. So you've added two stages of calculation to the boiler and two stages for the turbine, but I mean, they're, they're pretty simple. So that's what your thermal efficiency looks like. It's the work out of the high pressure turbine plus the work out of the low pressure turbine minus the pump work divided by the boiler heat input, main steam and reheat. Just what you'd expect, I think. Questions? Not too bad. You know, each little step through this is not so bad. It's just when you get the big problem that has all of it and you go, oh man, this is gonna take a while. So, and you know, I don't care if you use a steam property calculator to find states, but on the, we will have a test on this and you won't use a steam property calculator on the test. So if you're confident in your steam table ability, use whatever you want to on the homework. But the homework is your opportunity to, to, to kind of flex your, your steam table wings again from your thermal days. So, and FE exam, I mean, there's, kinda, there's all kinds of that stuff on the FE. I mean, there, it's just, it's gonna be there. Steam tables are hugely important in, you know, putting out a mechanical engineer. A mechanical engineer that can't use a steam table, that's not good, that's not good. So make sure that you're not one of those when you walk across that stage. Okay, uh, super critical. Um, 
This will be one of the topics. There's actually, it's interesting, there are now people that are putting out uh, supercritical cycles with CO2 as the working fluid. It's pretty interesting. It's a fairly new development. And um, it boils at much lower temperatures, and so it can be fueled by waste heat sources. So there's actually engines that are out there. I've got some pretty cool topics that I've come across. When I went to, uh, I took that trip to Ukraine with DOE, uh, they had some slides they wanted me to present. So I was, I did, I did a classroom with all these guys that all they spoke was Ukrainian, most of them. And so I, we had this translator in back and she was amazing because she was bilingual. And so I had a mic and she had a headphone and a mic and she's listening in English and translating instantaneously to Ukrainian. And when they ask a question, they have to get a mic and she instantly translates the question, I've got an earpiece. And so she's going back and forth. And so this woman is probably spending eh, five to six hours a day just sitting there listening and translating. Can you imagine doing that? I have, there's no way I could do that. I can't hardly speak English, much less to be, to be quick enough. I mean, think about how mentally quick you have to be to listen. And she was not an engineer. Now she's been around and she's heard a lot of this stuff before, so she's pretty good. But I mean, I was amazed. We bought, at the end of the day, we went out and we bought a bunch of presents for the translators and all that stuff, because that's pretty amazing. But anyway, they had, uh, they had these presentations and they had, a, you know, these Oak Ridge guys, they like to throw all this researchy, state-of-the-art new development stuff on there and at the end. And so I was going through this one presentation and I, I kept hitting all these cycles and I go, I'm there. I have no idea what that is. I'm on the internet, you know, researching this stuff. So there's some, there's some pretty, there's three or four topics that are pretty cool on there. So y'all can, y'all can fight over those. Uh, okay. Super critical. Um, so let's just take a look. So that's what the, that's what the uh, TS diagram looks, you know. So we come out of the pump at six, and you can achieve really high pressures without a super lot of energy because with a pump, because it's incompressible, right? So, you know, you just get a big strong motor and you push, and the pressure goes up pretty quick. It's not like trying to compress a vapor up to, you know, these super critical pressures, I mean, uh, TVA has got plants, um, 4,500 pounds pressure, something like that. I think some of them have gone up to 5,000 pounds. That may be considered ultra high. They have super, super high, super critical, and then they have ultra critical. And I'm not sure where they draw the line, distinction, but you know, it's pretty high. So anyway, and you know, so engineering students would probably like this because you miss the dome. You don't go through the saturation dome. So we come up, and this is the isobar at this supercritical pressure, is when it bends over, it never, you know, it's above the one that goes through the critical point. So you just go up and they just say, this is just fluid. It's liquid here and it's vapor here, and there's this magical transition and there's no boiling effect. Now don't ask me what it looks like, I don't know. I've always wondered, you know, I mean, I don't know if anybody has a reactor where you can, oh, you could probably, you could do it with CO2 or something. You probably couldn't, I don't know if you'd do it with steam because the pressure is pretty darn high. It'd have to be a really thick window for you to look in there and see it. I, I wonder what it looks like. It probably just all of a sudden, you know, go just transist from a liquid to a vapor, just kind of, whoosh, you know, as pressure goes up. I don't know. But you know like black yeah, probably so. Yeah, I guess so. You know, I mean, I, I, I think about it sometimes, I, but you know, I, I guess we should look on YouTube and say, you know, we can, can we watch a super critical transition from liquid to vapor? It's probably on there, everything. Between Google and YouTube, you can learn anything, right? <laughs> anyway, that's what happens. And so we, we miss the boiling effect and we wind up, you know, from six, so we push real hard in the pump and we get at this high pressure um, and then we start heating it 
And so, you know, six to one is, you know, heating in the boiler. And then we come out, you know, go through the first turbine section, then we go back and heat it up again, and then come down again. So, you know, the cycle, I think, is pretty much what you would expect. You just don't go through the dome. Ah, and we got the little blue ball. Okay. So I think we've said all this. Ah, we get to do it again. He, he likes it too. That's some graduate student doing this programming, I think. So supercritical, thermal efficiency is up to 47%. And ultra supercritical can go up to, say, 50%. That's pretty darn good with, you know, in, in, without doing a cogeneration kind of thing. So I think you, hopefully you guys have some idea what cogeneration is now. You know, we get, we typically get the electricity on the top side and we come out of the turbine with enough uh, temperature uh, that that steam is still useful. And then we take that steam out on the process and we use it instead. And so there, the, the process is the condenser. And so that's pretty cool. And so then it just gets brought back. And so uh, that we can get very high cycle efficiencies by doing that. Okay, uh, irreversibility. Well, here, let's, uh, let's go to the example sheet here. Oh, I think that's it. Yeah, we need to, this breaks it up a little and we need to look at some of these. Okay. So I've jettisoned all those nasty megajoules, kilojoules, <laughs> and I'm back into good old BTUs and pound force per square inch, where I ought to be. So I think this one's pretty similar to the last one, so we'll hit it pretty quick. Um, let's see, we got Rankin cycle, uh, steam leaves the boiler in a turn, 600 PSI, and that's, that's PSIA. Okay, let me tell you something now. I'll tell you this again, but this needs to sink in. When you get a test, and what? <clears throat> atmospheric, the, 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 the test will probably say, consider atmospheric pressure to be 15, you know, because 14.7 is obnoxious to deal with on a test. And then, I, and then you get told the boiler pressure is 585 PSIG. So what pressure do you go to the steam tables with? 600 PSIA. Now, if you spend half your time on the test interpolating at 585, it's not shame on me, it's shame on you. Because I set it up to be a straight lookout, but you didn't know the difference between PSIG and PSIA. That's why it gets written that way to see if you realize. Because when you go, you know, you got there in the world, you're walking in the boiler house and you look at the pressure gauge and it says 370, you know, 370. And you go back and you got to do some calculations for your boss and you got to get properties out of the steam table. Do you go to the steam table at 370 in terms of pressure? You better not if you want to stay employed long because you got to add atmospheric pressure to it and then, you know, if you do it right, if you got a barometer there, oh man, you could you carry your little barometer and say, oh man, that's 12.79. And then you get your calculator and you put in, you know, like that, and you put in your reports, we measure barometric pressure, so we have exactly the right. And they go, ooh, this guy's good, you know, about even if you say 15, that's acceptable. But you know, those are, those are silly little mistakes that we want to make sure you don't make. That's why we want you to make them on a test. And then we can slap your wrist for five points. And then you'll remember when you get out there in the world not to do that. That's what those Georgia Tech, you know, that's what those UT engineers do, see? And we don't, we don't want that. We don't want that. All right. So anyway, uh, condenser pressures, one, determine cycle efficiency. Uh, blah, 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 steady state. Now, so this is, I think this is pretty close to what we did, but I do want to go through this one because it shows the differences in unit conversions, okay? So, you know, we did the pump first and the pump work is just the enthalpy difference across it. 
and it's the integral of VDP, and we assume that it's uh, isentropic. Now, this is this expression is for isentropic. When you use this approach, you're calculating the isentropic enthalpy difference. So if you have, like if we tell you the isentropic efficiency of the pump is 70%, then you have another step to do beyond this. But this, this pump trick gets you the isentropic work or the isentropic enthalpy difference. Say that enthalpy difference is the work. But that's only completely true for S1 is equal to S2. So, you know, you know, the devil's in the details. You know, that's the way engine, that's the way life is. You know, big concepts are easy, but getting it right, the devil's in the details. Okay, so, so we look up the specific volume at one, and it's 0 0.01614. And what is specific volume? What is that? Feet cubed per pound mass, something like that. And then this is the pressure difference in PSI. And you should, you should work out these units, but you need to, if you just remember 144, because this, this has inches in it, square inches, right? And the 144 is gonna get rid of the square inches and convert it to square feet. And then what, 778 is what, BTUs? No, foot pound force per, it's foot pound force per BTU. That's the 778. You don't, you know, you don't really even have to remember all of the units if you just remember 144 over 778, you know, you get the right answer. But when you grade these things, this is the first thing you look for. Okay, they did the pump trick, that's good. Did they, did they get the units right? You know, because if you, if you don't put this in here, you get a crazy number here. And it, I mean, it just pops up like a sore thumb. Anyway. So we get that work, and then, so we go back here and we calculate H2 by, we just take H1 to the other side of the equation and add it on. So that's 60, 69.7 plus the 1.8 is the work. And so the enthalpy at two is 71.5 BTUs per pound. So that's the pump trick. Okay, uh, there you go. One, B, one BTU is 778.17 foot pound force. It's on the sheet, forgot about it, whoops. Okay, uh, so let's see, for the turbine work, well, we know it's H, H3 coming in minus H4 out, and we know right now it's isentropic. Um, and so H3, this is a lookup from the table from the superheat table. So you just look up the uh, enthalpy and entropy, and that would be at what? It's 600, 608, 600 pounds per square inch and 800 degrees. So that shouldn't be any trouble finding. And so these two are equal. So that's the entropy. So then this is the, uh, the entropy of the fluid at the low pressure minus, and when they published it, they put the parentheses in the wrong place. So I just scratched it out and move it. Um, <clears throat> two, 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 five. What? what is that? Well, he's just calculating quality. What is that one? That Never noticed that. Well, I just calculate quality. I, I, what is that? One minus x. Oh, okay. Oh, this. Yeah, the. I like these examples, but this is kind of funky. But you know, just calculate quality the same way that y'all ever do. What they're doing here. From here to here. So, what if you're right here? X, X represents that. Is that right? Let me see. Uh, where's my eraser? 
X is the fraction that's vapor. So one minus X is the fraction that's fluid, right? Yeah, so this is, it. yeah, this length represents X and this length is one minus X. So he's, come, he's got a little bit of a different nomenclature on calculating quality, but just calculate quality. And um, so the one minus X is the fraction that's liquid. And then he uses that to calculate the enthalpy. So I apologize for that. I, I, need, to, I need to redo this at some point. Anyway, he's, he's getting that uh, the enthalpy down inside the dome. And that is 9.913. Uh, and so then the turbine work is just the difference in enthalpy, uh, 474.6. And then the net work is the turbine minus the pump. So this is the turbine, that's the pump, subtract it off. Uh, uh, for the boiler, just the enthalpy difference across it. So these are this one. This one was from the pump exit, and this was the lookup. So subtract those. We get thirteen thirty six point one, and the cycle efficiency network over the heat input thirty six point nine, and then you can. Um, Calculate the, um, let's see, this is H4 minus H, that's the condenser. Yeah, this is the condenser heat flow. So if you put a control volume around the condenser, and so if you take the boiler input minus the condenser, so this is net heat, you get the same, you get the same work as we get right here. 492.8, 492.8. So that's just showing that the network is the net heat. So, okay, let's look at one more here. Or we may look at a couple more. Yeah, so this is a uh, reheat. So uh, let's see, so this thing, the, the way these examples, they kind of build on one another. And so it's the same basic setup, except um, our, Reheat pressure is 60. And so I don't guess I have a diagram. We can go back and forth to this. Yeah. So this is kind of what the. This is the, the diagram a little bit bigger. There you go. So this is what, 600, this is 60, and this is one. So we've got this action going on. Okay. So let's see. Uh, we just want to analyze this cycle. So he's headed to the turbine. The, uh, uh, the, the pump stuff didn't change. And so we get to reuse some of those numbers. Um, high pressure turbine. So these numbers were the same. There's his, <laughs> his funky way of doing quality. So this is one minus quality. So you can see it's, we're, we're almost all vapor. We're still slightly inside the dome. And then this is the calculation of H4. So we got 1170 uh, coming out of that first turbine. And then we go back to the boiler and we heat up, uh, let's see, what was our temperature we're heating back up to? 60, say so reheated to 800. So we're going back to 800. So that's at 60 and 800. You ought to be able to, oh, uh, here's, uh, here's some of the, the, the quality calculations, S3 is S4. Yeah, so say so he comes up with this, uh, where is it? 0 0.0083. And if you do the standard calculation, you come up with the actual quality, which is 0.9918. So 
anyway. Quality, remember, quality equals one is 100% steam. Quality equals zero is zero. But if you do one minus quality, then that's the fraction that's liquid, because it's either liquid or vapor. So, steam is vapor, right? what's that? Steam is vapor? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the vapor, right. Okay, so you got to find these two enthalpies here for this is um, coming out of the first turbine. Uh, this is going into the second turbine. This is coming out of the second turbine. And then, so the total turbine work, uh, the first turbine, this enthalpy difference, second turbine, this enthalpy difference. So we're 605.1. Here's the pump. Yeah, this, the pump turns out to be just the same as before, the 1.8. So these numbers are what we had previously. 71.5 going into the boiler. And now on the boiler, we've got you know two sections, uh, main steam and reheat. So just gotta plug those enthalpies in. So now the boiler heat addition is 1596.9. Net work total, the sum of the two turbines minus the pump, you get 603.3 and then divided by the boiler heat inputs, 37.8. So, so he's saying that the moisture content leaving the turbine decreased uh, as a result of reheating, decreased from 18.6% to 4.1%. So that's significant improvement for the turbine. Uh, I don't see what this one is. Consider uh, Oh, that's the same one, <laughs> isn't it? What is this? Is this? No, what is this? Is this different? It's got to be different somehow. Oh, this is regenerative. Ah, that's this is dad. We're not. Let's go back to the PowerPoint here real quick. We'll get there in a second. Okay, so we jumped ahead. Okay, yeah, so um, discussion now turns to irreversibilities, basically friction, uh, stray heat transfer, that sort of thing. Um, so he breaks it down by systems and he's, I think he's saying, the, you know, the, the combustion, the combustion is a huge irreversibility, um, you know, because that heat transfer how do you get reversible heat transfer? You remember this? Do you want to? You may not want to, I don't know. It's one of these theoretical discussions. But to have reversible heat transfer, you have to have an, an infinitely small temperature difference. But to transfer a finite, to transfer a finite amount of heat reversibly, you have to have an infinite surface area. So it just, you know, so heat transfer is not reversible. Especially at a boiler, you got combustion temperatures of 3,000 plus. You got steam temperature of 1,000. That's a huge delta T. So that's a huge irreversibility. Um, so, and you know, they make a big deal about irreversibilities being external to the system under consideration or internal to the system under consideration. Real concerned about that, to be honest with you. It's a thermodynamic point, but anyway. So, combustion irreversibilities in chapter 13. Uh, 
looking at the internal. We're going to get through some of this. Okay, uh, so let's get over to, to, to where the rubber meets the road here, and that's the isentropic efficiency of the turbine and the pump. Okay, and you can identify that easily by looking at the, if you have a TS diagram, by looking at the pump. And so the, 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 the process that goes straight up from the three, and this is tag 4S to indicate that it's isentropic. The real one is gonna have some entropy increase. And so they usually share that with a dashed line. So we're gonna come out, the real pump state at exit is four. The ideal is 4S. And so the way we've been calculating that exit enthalpy on the pump gives us 4S, and then we have to go to the equation for the isentropic efficiency of the pump in order to modify that to get the enthalpy at four. Same discussion on the turbine. Turbine expansion isentropic is straight down at constant entropy. The real one has some entropy generation, so we get the dash line over here to two. So that's the nomenclature. And of course, there's the equation. I think we've had this up there before. And so when you write this, you just, you just wanna remember, this is a comparison between the second law efficiencies or comparisons of a real turbine to an ideal turbine. Turbine makes work, so the ideal is gonna make more. So the ideal goes in the denominator, the real one goes in the numerator, and then we just plug in the enthalpy definitions. So when you get to this stage, you do what we had done previously, and that will give you H2S, the exit enthalpy for the isentropic, and then you say if you have a number like, you know, it could be 0.85. So the 0.85 here, you know everything but H2. You solve that and adjust your exit enthalpy for H2. Okay, so I'll work develop actual turbine. And it's at the, uh, the same inlet condition and exit pressure. That it has to be, for, to be a comparison, it has to be at the same uh, inlet steam condition and exit pressure. That shows. And then there's your isentropic on the bottom and that relates to that. So that's not too bad. Just another small step of complexity. Questions, everybody good? Okay, so then we, we do the pump. And so, you know, it counts for this efficiency. It counts for irreversibilities and losses and friction and all that in the pump. And so now, because the pump is a work consuming device, we put the isentropic on top because the actual pump's gonna require more work, so it goes on the bottom in the denominator. And just plug in the appropriate uh, enthalpy uh, terms. So for the isentropic pump, it's H4S minus H3, and for the real pump, it's H4 minus H3, and bingo. So. So it's the same inlet and exit pressure on both of them. Okay. All right. There we go. So um, in these problems, we we typically I don't know some of the ones I give you might have some pressure drops in them, but in general, in the that the thermal one level, you usually ignore. Uh, the frictional, the pressure drops between components or going through a component. So you just have to read the problem. At least in, in chapter eight of the thermal book they do. Okay, regenerative feed water heaters. So this has to do with increasing the average temperature during the heat addition and making the cycle more efficient. Okay, opened and closed heaters. Uh, let me see what slide is that's 51. Let's go back. 
let's go all the way back to the real cycle. All right, so you see any open or closed feed water heaters? Can you tell the difference? I know it's a little hard to see. Jared, he's pointing, man. He's on this. Is the three on the right closed and the one left open? No. There's only one open. What's another word for an open feed water heater? I got any steam people in here? A deaerator. What's a deaerator? What does that sound like? Yeah. It's the deaerator actually scrubs, strips any non condensable gases out of the feed water as it goes in. It's a different beast. It also does heat it, but it scrubs out any oxygen, any nitrogen, any other gases. And that guy right there is the DA. Because that's like, you know, you can think about it as a tank where it all mixes together. That's not really what it looks like. I should, uh, I'll try to pull up a YouTube video of a deaerator, and they, they make different kinds. A lot of them have kind of, it's like a, a tank and it has kind of a neck that comes up and the water comes in there and falls down. There's plates in there on a lot of the big ones. And the, string, the steam is uh, injected and it flows up across the water as it's on those plates to try to strip out any gases. By heating it up, the gases will come out of solution in the feed water here. That's how you get, you know, you know if you ever notice, if you take a, take, take a, a glass and get water out of the, cold water out of the drinking fountain and set it on the table and come back in an hour, let it warm up. It's got all these air bubbles in it. Actually, probably mostly nitrogen bubbles, but it's got bubbles in it. And it's because as you heat up water, any dissolved gases become less soluble and they come out of solution. And so that's what that deaerator is doing. It's just taking water, I don't know, what are we coming in at? 255 and coming out at what, 285, is that right? Or is that enthalpy? That's degrees. Uh, anyway, yeah, is it just, it's yeah, 304, that's it, isn't it? Yeah, because we're pumping, yeah, we're pumping. So we're coming in 255. So, you know, we're picking up, what, 45, 50 degrees, something like that, and that forces, that'll force some of that any of those gases out of there, and then they get vented out of this tank. Now, since this stuff mixes together, every time you have an open heater, you have to have a set of pumps. Because say, this pump, what's our, dis does this thing give us discharge pressure? This, this pump has to get it all the way back in the boiler. And a requirement is you have to have I think you typically have 50% more pressure coming in than the boiler operates at. So if that's on uh, util um, industrial boilers, I suspect it's the same. Uh, so if it's 1800 times 1 1.5, so that's about 2,700 pounds of pressure here in that feed water line and you've got losses through all this. So you've probably got 3,000 PSI coming out of those pumps. Because look what they're pushing through. They're pushing through this heat exchanger, this heat exchanger, this heat exchanger, and all this piping to get it back to the boiler. That's the last pump. And these are just heat exchanger, steam condensing on tubes, heating it up. I don't think there's another pump somewhere. Oh, well, this is the last pump. I'm sorry, what? Why don't they put one after like the last heater? Why don't they put like a smaller pump there and one after the last heater? Because it's cheaper. These are, you don't have small pumps. And, you know, okay. a power plant, a power plant, you don't have a small anything <laughs> much. I mean, this is, this is big stuff. This is, this is probably a two or 3,000 horsepower motor. Yeah. 
So you could put one pump after the aerator and then one pump after the last heat, after the last heater. Well, you could, but they don't. Okay. Yeah, I mean, but you don't have to. See, the point is, you have to here because this stuff all mixes together. I mean, if you make this 3,000 pounds, I mean, you, you know, you, I mean, how are you gonna make that 3,000 pounds? You know, you can't. This thing, this thing is gonna operate basically at the extraction pressure. Uh, yeah. Say, and this is the, do, 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 no, 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 no. It's at 400, I mean, 450? Whatever that says, that's 625, that's four something, kind of garbled. But that's the pressure of the extraction. So that heater, is that what that thing says? Oh, I can't read the thing. Can't see my own diagram. Let me get them over here. Oh, well that, that's closed, that's not the, this valve up here is, this valve up here is closed. That's not the main line, line feeding it. Uh, what is it? Just, uh, so anyway, we're coming off of one of these. This is coming in here. Is this the main one? Is it four? Looks like four. What's that? 71.3, I believe is four, yeah, and we're saying 67.7. So that's the actual pressure drop. Yeah, I'm sorry. They, 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 there's an opportunity, I'm not sure why that valve's there, but there's an opportunity to dump steam to the open feed water heater. Yeah, they got all kinds of bells and whistles in here. I mean, I, I don't know what they all mean. Anyway, so that's the open feed water heater. The rest of them are closed. Uh, 51. Mm. Okay. Uh, yeah, open and closed heater. So we, we kind of hit that. Okay, so <laughs> this is the uh, simplified diagram. So now we feed the feed water heaters with extraction steam. And now we get into these little Y's, ones and Y's, or you can use whatever symbol you want. But so, you know, like we did before, this is the fraction of the main steam, the main steam flow that comes to the open feed water heater. And see, we show a pump. So we're showing a pump over here out of the condenser pumping it through here and then we show a pump over here because this guy on an ideal cycle like this, whatever this extraction pressure is, we say that's the same uh, pressure in the open heater. And so as far as your energy balances, you know, you've just got Y times H2N. Uh, let's see over here at five, you've got one minus Y times H5N and you've got one, it's all put back together times H6 out. So this term plus this term equals this term. And then you can solve for the Y. So, yeah. But, uh, and we can look on the uh, TS diagram. Let me see. So uh, if we didn't have that feed water heater, what we would, we would be, uh, at five, we would be going into the boiler, right? You come out of the condenser, out of the pump, and straight back to the boiler is what we've been doing. And so without the feed water heater from five, we would come up five all the way up to one. So when we have the feed water heater, but we, uh, we go from what, five to six, and then six to seven is um, the pump, the second pump. And so then the actual boiler cycle 
with the feed water heater is seven to one. And you can see there's a significant difference between five to one and seven to one in terms of the average temperature of the uh, heat addition. And so that's, that's what boosts the uh, efficiency. All right, now we got a few more here. Okay, uh, let's see, it's open feed water heater. So what are we doing here, ice and trouble? Okay, well, so, you know, we just have, uh, we have different mass flows of steam through the uh, two turbine stages and we gotta have two pumps. So those are the components that uh, get changed. And steam generator, condenser, still constant pressure. Uh, mixing occurs within the feed water heater. Yeah. So that's an irreversibility. Okay. And open feed water here seems to operate adiabatically. Yeah, we typically, I mean, these things, they should be insulated. They should be wrapped up pretty well. So, and they usually are. So usually don't have much in the way of stray heat transfer through there. So assuming that's adiabatic is a good assumption. Okay, so referring to TS dire heat transfer to the cycle takes place from seven to one rather than from state A. What is he doing with state? What is he doing rather than from state A, state one is with the, if there was no open feed water heater. To me, like it would be five. Huh, I'm not sure where how he defines a state A. It's not on the diagram. That's at the high pressure. Oh, 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 I see. I see. What he's doing. Yeah, he's right. It would be A because. This first pump would have to see, this is an intermediate pressure. A is supposed to be, well, yeah, for, for an ideal pump, A should be straight up from here because that's at the boiler pressure. Yeah, I said that wrong. So um, this pump would have to take us from here up to this ISO bar, so that's point A. So I misspoke on that, yeah. I, I just was looking at the, the state points, but this A would be, you know, without all of this stuff, we come out of here, this pump's got to get us all the way to the boiler pressure, which is state A. Yeah. So he's right. Figured he was, but sorry. Okay, so we can follow a unit mass. Unit mass enters the turbine. At, oh yeah, this is kind of cool. He's showing the mass split. So we got all of it or unit mass, or I think of it as all of it. And then we got the portion that goes to the open feed water heater. And then the rest of it, it turns into one minus Y and it goes all around there. And then it mixes back together in the open feed water heater. Come on, put it back together. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, and then it, it goes back around the cycle, okay. All right, I'd say that's pretty good for today. Uh, we'll try to finish up. Well, we got to do this uh, Brayton cycle uh, after this. Yeah. Uh, let's get this off of there. <laughs> uh, what I do? I lost my eraser. Just a second. Dad gum it. Can't find anything. Let's start again. Okay, right here, x equals zero. Uh, right here, x equals one. 
you're 50, if you're 50%, if that was halfway, x equals 0.5. So he, sw he, he works with one minus x instead of x. And I mean, I'm good with, I've, I've seen the math enough that it works, but I don't know why he did it. It's stupid. What's the difference in open feed water heater and a closed feed water heater? Well, the open is the deaerator. You're stripping, you're stripping the non-condensable gases so out of the Does it add extra strain to it or something? Or is it open atmosphere or? Well, there is a vent. There's a vent on it. I remember that from last I, I mean, most, most industrial systems, um, I'd have to, I'd have to check the, I, I, I'd have to check the Brown book and see, I've got a Brown book that has all the detailed diagrams for, for Kingston. I'm not sure where they take the DA flow, whether they try to recover. I mean, some people, okay, you can actually try to recover the energy in the steam, but you have to bleed steam out of that feed water heater to take those gases with it. And so there is, there is a pipe, you know, someplace a one to two inch pipe that, that bleeds steam. The atmosphere? Uh, yeah. That's why it's called open? Yeah. So a closed one doesn't have well, like that? Well, it's open because the, uh, the steam, the stripping steam and the feed water actually mix. So oh, you're, you're actually, nice? oh yeah. Yeah, that's why it's called open? Yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. In fact, let's- and it closes, it's like a shell in the tube. Exactly, okay. close the shell in the tube. Let's see what the mass flow rate is on that. See if it shows more. Well, let's blow it up. Let's see. So, what that one? Okay, so. Well, what are they doing? They're putting. Is it, uh, there is it. I can't really see what's the the flow rate here. Do we get a flow rate? Here's. Uh, we don't get one on that one. Do we have anywhere back here? There it is. Wow, well, no. Is that it? Is that yeah? Seven oh seven oh four pounds mass. Okay, so that's coming in there. And then, you got a couple of different ones here. Yeah, see they're putting more. More steam pounds in than they are what, water. Oh yeah, you gotta, you gotta trace this stuff back. You see, you can do a mass balance on this thing. But see, we've got, we got a million, oh, 12 right here. We're picking up, see that's going in. I'm not sure. Say, so, yeah, I'm not sure where that's coming from, but that's what is this? This is that's uh, fourteen twenty nine. That's healthy. Yeah. See, we're uh, yeah, that's enthalpy there. So, see, this we got this much coming in here, but it's coming, but it's coming out down here. Yeah, see, that's the same flow, but look, and that, that's being condensed in there. So that whatever this is, I say, you got to go find this stuff in the cycles. It's coming in, and this is being heated. Am I right? Yeah. Some kind of water? Seven, oh, that's makeup water. Yeah, makeup water. Yeah, so back yeah, the okay. Uh, I hadn't looked at all this in detail in a while. Um, that's makeup water coming in at 70, 38 enthalpy. And then... Um, it's being heated. It's being oh, so that's, that's adding, staying. So they're adding some from the uh, generator and some from the makeup water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's it. I mean, the DA is where the makeup water comes in. The condensate. Um, is this the steam that steam that leaves here, and then this mm -hmm. is the con this is the condensed water that's going back to the. So this like dark black line is that steam leaving the aerator? No, that's condensate. Look, this is. 
This is steam coming in here. This is preheating makeup water. Oh, so steam's coming in here, and then the condensate off of that steam is coming here? Well, they're putting them both in the same thing, though. Yeah, like exactly. That. Yeah, see, so this is the condensate. We're taking steam there, and we're heating up the makeup water, and that condensate's falling in there. And then this is... They're putting steam in there, too, though. Yeah. yeah. And then this is water, too, right, coming in here? Yeah, this is this is the from the turbine. Yeah, this is the main feed block. Yeah, this is the condensate that's coming back. That's coming in here. Um, that's makeup water. Let's see, we've got night. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so so see that balances. But see that that's uh, vapor okay. at eleven eighty. That's been that's been vaporized. So and see, I think I I, I think the dash line is steam, and I think the solid line is water. Okay. See. So this steam comes in, it condenses, it preheats this, this dumps in here, this dumps in here, and this guy, there's another 12,830 12, here that's coming from, so that's the from, main, from this that's extraction. That's the main steam supply for the deer then, right? Because it's so much more than this one. Well, it's, uh, we got both. Look, this one, there's almost 20,000. It's coming out of the makeup oh, water. Okay. See, they they vaporized the makeup water. Okay. Yeah, well, we'll go over this in class. Cool. I, I, I just I was confused about open and close, but once you said that they touch, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Where's the uh, main trap? Is that something that's going 